Good afternoon, distinguished guests, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John and I have the pleasure of being your MC today. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, NTU, I welcome you to the panel discussion on long-term implications of India's 2019 general elections. To start the proceedings, I would like to invite Ambassador Gopinath Pillai, Chairman, ISAS, to deliver the opening remarks. Ambassador Pillai, please. <clears throat> Professor Walter Anderson, my distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. In spite of the dismal weather that you all managed to get here, it seemed to indicate that there is considerable interest in the subject that we are about to talk about. Uh, I must express my gratitude to Rajaratnam School of International Studies, NTU, for co-hosting this event. We now have a program to try and link up with other think tanks within the university, within Singapore, and hold pro joint programs. This is one of the first that we are having. My gratitude also to Professor Walter Anderson for being here. He was in India studying the elections on the ground, and he has written several books, one of which uh, we had a chance to discuss on the RSS. Very interesting book, very, maybe some, some, some statements there could be challenged, and I think he'll be quite willing to, if you have read the book and you have some points, you could blend it into this discussion. Should not be a problem. But I want to thank him for being here. He has been here three, four days and not bored with Singapore. So that's something unique. So we welcome him for this. Um, after a drawn out, hard fought, and often bitter general election, the results were announced on 23rd May. BJP won a landslide uh, won a landslide victory. As the dust settles, it is now time to interpret what the results mean for India, the wider South Asian region, and the world. ISAS congratulates BJP for its tremendous victory. ISAS was the first institution to invite Mr. Modi to Singapore when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat. And there were a lot of questions asked and I was put on the map to say why, you know, that there's Americans don't give him a visa, why are you inviting sort of thing. But I felt that he was running the, the best administered state at that time, the state that was producing the best results. And we needed to know how it worked and we needed to listen to him. So we invited him. And I think that was the first, our first uh, contact with uh, Mr. Modi. And we were very impressed. And we have been following his progress very uh, closely. The panel, as you know, very distinguished people. And they're going to talk about the long-term implications of the elections today. I would, for my introductory few words, I would like to take a slightly different position and sort of ask the people here as well as maybe representatives of uh, BJP to look at something a little different, and that is I would like to look at what I would call uh, my wish list now that BJP has come into power with an absolute majority for a second time, seem to be very much in control of things. They can make things happen. Now, I thought while my 
distinguished panelists will talk about long-term implications. I can look at maybe a, a few naughty problems and see what we can do, uh, what the government can do to address them. The first wish, I've not got a whole slate of wishes. I have, but I've cut them down to five. And the first one I would like to suggest is that following this tremendous victory, I would like to see India move to the international platform confidently and take its rightful position as one of the major powers of the world. India need not be diffident because it has just conducted what is probably the biggest election. Everything else pales by a comparison. Right, 600 million people voted and the results were known on the day it was supposed to be known. There were no coups, no counter coups, there were no people running around burning buses. Everything was done in a very civilized manner and PJP too. So it's time for them, not only just to be a permanent member of the United Nations, but to be a, a fairly strong major power in the world, in the scheme of things in the world. India, because of its size, its size of the economy, and what it is likely to be in a few years' time, third largest economy in the world, I think India need not hang on to the coattails of anyone. Whether you are wooed by the Americans or the Chinese, doesn't matter. India can take an independent position. It need not be preachy like in the past. One of the things the Americans disliked about the, the Indians, it, Mr. Uh, Professor Anderson may correct me, but I felt when I was a student, and at that time, and, you know, Foster Dulles had to talk about India, he would be very cynical about it, but they needed it. <clears throat> and India was the counterweight for many other things. So uh, there was a, a certain, certain uh, sort of uh, diffidence on the part of India why they there sort of thing. But now they can do it on their own, they can be friendly. I mean, Japan is a very good friend and uh, maybe not too many conditions, but others have their own agenda. You have to see and whether what fits in with you. But India should also in the same process be friendly and useful to its immediate neighbors because there's always a feeling that India tries to play the big brother and this offends our no smaller India's smaller neighbors. So when, you, when I say take the rightful place in the community of nations, I think it, it comes with certain responsibilities and we must be aware of this and we should do it. That's number one. Second, much more difficult, I yearn to see the day when India declares that it supports an open economy. In almost every trade negotiation, India is seen as a spoiler. They will see what can be done to subvert the uh, solution. So I think we must change this. India needs to grow. India needs to make sure that wealth is created. And for that, you must have a, quite a high degree of commercial transactions. Here again, since I have the benefit of having talked to Professor Anderson, he will tell you, probably in his speech, the workings of the inner part of, the inside view of uh, BJP and what they feel about opening up the economy. And this is very important because it's not only the outside lobbies who can influence you. The people inside who control the levers of power, they can also 
uh, influence your decision. But whatever it is, as a large country with tremendous potential, take agriculture. Agriculture is always is the thing that pulls you down. But India is the one country that has the means of not only feeding itself, but feeding quite a big part of Asia. It has got more arable land than anybody else. And if you don't make use of this, then of course, India's ability to innovate, which is not substantial, but it can be. So this must be done. That's my, my humble request, my wish that I'd like to convey to the BJP, that they must open up and expand the trade facilities. The third wish that I have, that India opens up its educational institutions, training institutions, to foreign investment. I'm not sure whether the law is still here, but I remember until quite recently, the Universities Commission, the Grants Commission, always said that you are not to take profits from your, your educational investments out of the country. Because as uh, Mr. Kapil Sibyl once told me, Gopinath, you are a businessman. That's why you think this way. But money made out of education should be spent on education because it's a calling. So I, I humbly asked him, humili humility itself, I asked him, when your educational institutes depend on pension funds and other funds to fund their activities, and if they cannot get a return to take it back and give a dividends to these people, where are you going to get the money? I didn't get any satisfactory answer, but I think that is one of the problems when you don't allow a return to be given to the shareholders, then this law may have changed recently, I don't know. But as far as I knew, it hadn't. So that's my third. Uh, that we, Because once you, if you look at the last Make in India attempt, when China announced that it is going to be the manufacturing hub of the world, they had a few thousand youngsters trained technically, whether they are, they are what, uh, plumbers, electricians, whatever. They were there ready to take over jobs. When India announces what it was going to do, uh, make India, hardly anything, no preparation had been done. But if you allow foreign institutions to do training, and they bring in their content, they bring in their recognition. It's not only creation of wealth within the country, but these people can go out, get jobs in other parts of the world. India has the largest workforce in terms of age, the, the younger age group, and they can contribute tremendously to the, to the GDP of the country, as well as in, uh, uh, you know, the growth factor, make sure that the growth factor takes place. The fourth wish that I have <clears throat> is that India must go an extra mile to strengthen the various institutions that they have. These institutions were well known and respected right around the world. But during the election, just before the elections, there were signs that they were going through some stress. And this may not be a good thing. I think whether it is the RBI, whether it is, uh, oh, what's the other one, the Election Commission, or the judiciary, and I'm just taking three, if you strengthen them, I think it brings up India's name in the world as a working democracy with respect for institutions that are, that are necessary for the growth of this, uh, this factor. 
So that's it. Finally, and to me the most important, that India must try and instill a high degree of integrity in our business dealings with outside world. I'll tell you why I'm saying this. But before that, this is absolutely necessary. Many of the countries of Asia, many in Southeast Asia, I always say their entrepreneurship varies inversely with integrity. Now, if you think about that, that means that the more entrepreneurial you are, the less you care about integrity. This is the f a fact in many of the countries. India should not be in that category. India should have, the, the variance must be direct. That the more entrepreneurial you are, the more you must be concerned about integrity. Sometime, I think last year, I was in Delhi or Bombay somewhere in India, and I was reading one of the local English papers. And there was an interview by a visiting Caucasian visitor. Um, and he said something very significant. He said, I invest in various parts of the world. In most of this, in many of this, I lose money. I tell myself, I made a mistake. I did not study the market. I didn't understand the market. And I went in and didn't succeed. In India, if I lose money, I always feel I've been cheated. Because Indians are very clever, and they'll tell me all sorts of things and make me believe this is so and this is wrong. Now, this is a bad image for a country to have. So my, out of five wishes, my last wish is that we should go the extra mile, and the, the education in integrity must start from school level. Telling lies is wrong. I remember when I was a kid, I was born in Singapore, but I spent quite a few years of my childhood in India. My grandfather always said, if you tell lies, you misrepresent, that's a sin. It may probably the biggest sin that you can commit. So you should never... So I grew up with the fear that you will be punished by, if not by the, this world, some other world uh, will punish you. So you grew up with that. Now, never mind, you know, this is one good way of making a quick buck, and therefore we do this. Our standards must be... In, uh, if you look at India, in the branding, Japan is number one. Singapore is number two. I'm very proud of this, because they see that Singapore generally uh, is not. There was a time when I used to do some import-export business. When you export something to Indonesia, they will take your price that you have given and put a premium on it and charge a duty on that. This was done for every country, including Singapore, but not for Japan. So I used to make a lot of noise to say, look, we are as honest as the Japanese, and why are you doing this? But the impression is, no, Japanese were always very honest. The others were not. But subsequently, Indonesia changed, and it's true. So this is a very important factor. The culture, the business culture must be one based on honesty and straight dealing. It may not be possible always in business, but it must, best effort must go into it to try it. So that's my fifth. Ladies and gentlemen, I've taken longer than I should. I'm sorry about it, but uh, hopefully my panelists will, will talk more on the long-term implications of the results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Pillai. We will now move to the panel discussion. I would like to invite the following speakers to please take their seats. The speakers for the session are Professor Walter Anderson, Senior Adjunct Professor of South Asia Studies at the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University, United States. 
Dr. Sinderpal Singh, head of the South Asia program, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, and Dr. Amitindu Palit, senior research fellow and research lead of trade and economics at ISAS in US. Moderating the session will be Dr. Rana Joy Sen, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead of Politics, Society, and Governance at ISAS in US. And so I will now hand the panel over to Dr. Sen. Uh, thank you for the introductory remarks, uh, Chairman Pillay, and a very warm welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion, looking at the long-term implications of the Indian elections. Uh, the results of the Indian elections, which came as a surprise to many, especially the, the margin of the BJP's victory, has been quite endlessly parsed, analyzed, dissected over the last few days, ever since the results were out on May 23rd. So today what we'll be really doing is not uh, dissecting the results as much, but looking ahead to uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, second term. Um, and we have three very distinguished panelists to address various facets of the, the, the coming five years. Uh, we have Professor Walter Anderson, uh, we have Dr. Amitendra Palit, and we have Dr. Sindhapal Singh. Uh, their bios are all in front of you, so I won't go into uh, the details. Uh, before handing over the floor to uh, Professor Walt Anderson, uh, a few broad questions that I think uh, might be of interest to both the audience, uh, which hopefully will be addressed by all the panelists. Um, you know, the one uh, which uh, I, I hope Professor Walt Anderson will address is, is something that uh, Lloyd and Suzanne Rudolph who were both, who were advisors to both of us with an uh, interval of a few years at the University of Chicago, uh, had talked in the 80s about something called the persistent centrism of, of Indian politics. And this was something that has been applied to, uh, of course, the Congress, but also to the, the Vajpayee government. And that's something that, uh, you know, uh, is, is an idea we, we need to discuss whether it applies to the current uh, dispensation. Or are we sort of seeing, as another political scientist has said, uh, uh, not so much parties becoming centrist, but the Indian mainstream possibly moving rightwards? So is this a sort of long-term trend uh, that is happening? And in conjunction to that, are we seeing a, a second dominant party system? Of course, for much of independent India, we've seen the Congress in, in power. It's only from 2009. I think that the forces, political forces, have definitely shifted. So not only have we seen the, the Congress, uh, Indian National Congress, perform disastrously for the second time running, but an important fact that's not been noted so much in the discussions is that the regional parties, for the first time in many years, have actually gone well below the 50% vote share. So are we seeing a fundamental transformation of party politics uh, or the political party system in India? Uh, on the economics fund for Dr. Uh, Palit, uh, hopefully he'll be sort of looking at uh, you know, whether the new government has the appetite for, for uh, structural reforms. Uh, as we know, jobs as well as uh, uh, growth figures are a bit of a concern now. And as we speak, uh, two, two cabinet committees have been set up uh, yesterday to address both the issue of, of unemployment as well as uh, issues around growth and investment. And finally, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Singh, hopefully we'll, we'll look at some of the, uh, the, the issues around foreign policy. I think there is a con consensus that uh, Prime Minister Modi in his first term was much more successful in his foreign policy than some had anticipated, given that uh, he, it was really a bank state. We did not know what to expect of the government. Um, so I guess the uh, questions around the immediate uh, neighborhood following the, the airstrike, Valakot airstrike in February, that would be one of the issues. And of course, the, the thorny issue of India-US relations, given uh, the trade war that has enveloped us currently. So with this very short preamble, uh, the floor is over to the speaker. May I invite Dr. Anderson first to talk about the political landscape? Thank you. Uh, 
Well, it's a real privilege to be here. I was last in Singapore about 18 years ago, and I was with the government at that time, so it was a whole different perspective. I've seen much more of the city, and this time I've seen it with my wife, uh, rather than seeing it uh, alone, so I've seen a lot more, and I thank uh, 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 the people for inviting me to this, particularly uh, Roger Mohan, who I've known forever. He's one of these people you never know when you first met them because you've known them forever. Uh, and he's been a close friend of mine, uh, and so his wife, for the two of us uh, since that time. I'd also like to thank the chairperson, Dr. Rana Joyce Sen, uh, and Ambassador Gopinath Pillai, for whom we had a long conversation at lunchtime yesterday on some of the issues he brought up. Do you want to get the map? Uh, this map is, gives you a rather spectacular example of what happened in the elections when it comes up. You'll see it. I'll wait for it comes up because I wanted to say some things that sort of work off the map. There it is. Now you see a rather spectacular. The first to the left is 2014, and to the right is 2019, and the orange, to no one's surprise, is the BJP. But there, is some, there are some differences in the two, in that the BJP uh, margins in 2019 are larger than they, they were in 2014. I'm not going to spend a long time on the results of the election, as you mentioned, because you know it has been talked about by many people in other forums in much more detail than I could possibly do it. Now, I do want to say a few things. Uh, one thing I want to say very briefly, what happened, and this map tells you something about that. Uh, why it happened, and then I want to get into some questions which I hope will be a basis of discussion for the questions and answers as we look to the future of, of uh, India and the politics of India. Okay, first of all, you can see in this map, the BJP won again uh, a landslide for the second time in a row. It had a majority on its own. It won a majority of the 437 seats that it contested, and the winning margin had grown from 282 seats in 2014 to 303 seats in 2019. I say that with a little trepidation because you will sometimes see 302 and other times you'll see 303 because there's, some, there's still some issue about one of the seats that ran. So maybe somebody here knows what happened to that particular seat. And if you know, uh, if you factor in the victory of its allies in 2019, the figure goes up to, here again, 352 or 353, depending on how that particular seat went uh, that was in doubt. The BJP's percentage of the popular vote went up significantly. It was 31.3% in 2014, and it increased to 38.5% in 2019, and with you, if you count allies in the National uh, Democratic Alliance, it goes up to almost 50%. This is why the comment that you made that the regional parties, which in the past few elections have received about 50%, went down considerably when the NDA itself got almost 50%, and then you add the other large national party, which is the Congress, and add that to that, you have the regional parties actually, for the first time in quite a while, significantly dip in the percentage of the popular vote, and that might be an issue we want to get into in the questions and answers in the discussion that we have. Now, if you look at the map, you can see in both elections, there are areas where the BJP was not the winner. If you go in the south of India, particularly Kerala, uh, which is the far south of India, and if you go to the next uh, state up uh, in India, uh, Andhra Pradesh, the BJP was uh, virtually not represented at all. Um, and also in Kerala, uh, there are no BJ, which is on the southwest coast of India, there are no BJP seats that were won in Kerala. There was only one seat won by a BJP ally in Tamil Nadu, and up in Andhra, there were no BJP seats at all. Where the BJP made more of an impact, however, which it didn't have before, as you can compare the two maps here, is in the northeastern part of India, Orissa, um, West Bengal, and the far northeast, which is one of the interesting things we might get into, is how the far northeast of India shifted to be an almost total orange area. And the BJP and allies control, I think, all the states 
in the Northeast these days, which is one of the great transformations that's taken place in Indian politics. Now, what else has happened in India that's interesting? We saw the virtual collapse of the communist parties in India. I think they have three or four, and there's some debate about that, about how many seats that they actually won on the national level. It's very few. They lost in their former strongholds of West Bengal and Kerala. Secondly, what happened to the long dominant Congress party? It, it gained, but very marginally, from 44 to 52 seats. That's not even enough to be considered an official opposition party in the Indian parliament, where you need 10% of the parliamentary members to be considered an opposition party. Then take the Am Admi Party. The Am Admi Party had been considered the hope of much of the urban liberal class in India. Its last several years had been a period of turmoil in the Am Admi Party, and it lost every seat in its center in Delhi in the last election. Now, what was left was a group of regional parties, and they were unable to work together against the BJP in the elections. And it's interesting if you see what's happened to them after the elections. There's been a certain cracking in many of them. Some of them have left their parties and joined the BJP, and the leadership is almost invariably consulting with the center, because if you are a regional party in control of a state government, you have to have good relations with the center. And every, all of them, and I think even Mumta Banerjee has actually, I'm told, has actually reached out to contact various people in, uh, in the central government of Modi because of the necessity of governing with cooperation of the, the region, uh, of the central government. Now, why did the BJP win? Very controversial. Some of you may disagree with what I have to say, and I'm going to make it simplified uh, to keep the talk minimal, because one could talk for three hours on this subject, but I'm going to talk for three minutes on, on this subject. And th there are what I call the three M's that dominated uh, the structure of elections in India. Money, machinery, and you all know what the third M is, and Modi himself was an enormous factor, a charismatic figure. When I got to India a few weeks ago, before the elections, and we went to Haryana and UP, and you asked people, at least when I asked people, who are you voting for? They didn't give me the name of the candidate. They didn't even give me the name of the party. They gave me the name of Modi, either for or against. I'm voting for Modi or I'm voting against Modi, which is exactly what Amit Shah the, the uh, management person that has long been with Modi wanted, and the opposition fell into the trap, which he more or less had set for them by focusing the election on Modi. Okay, let's take the issue of money. The BJP, according to the National Mon uh, Monitor of Party Financing, the Association of Democratic Reform, gives figures as to how much money the various party raised. The BJP raised 10 times as much as all the opposition parties combined. You didn't have to be in India long to see the results of that. That you had huge billboards everywhere where Modi's face was, was on the billboard. If you looked in social media, there were thousands of messages giving you reasons to vote for Narendra Modi. Television. One day I was flipping the dial and I came across Modi doing yoga. Yes, Modi doing, there was a kind of animated Modi and that he was built like a gymnast doing some very complicated sets of yoga. And I thought, how did that happen? Well, guess what TV channel that was? That was Namo. <laughs> A, cha a TV station that had been set up, and so someone still hasn't explained to me the technicalities, the legalisms of how this happened, but it was a TV station set up, devoted to advancing the cause of Narendra Modi. And there he was going through these complicated yoga exercises with soothing music in the background, with a skeleton of the human body telling you what parts of the body were uh, affected by this yoga. It was actually brilliantly done. Whoever was in charge of that, did a brilliant job. And they had the money to do a brilliant job because they obviously got the best that India had in terms of TV production to get involved in this effort. 
Um, let's take machinery. This is where Amit Shah, the longtime colleague of the Prime Minister, did a brilliant job. In fact, one of the problems that the BJP faces as we look to the future is who's going to replace him and when. What I hear, there's going to be an interim, and it could be a substantial interim. But even if he's replaced, and we're being maybe recorded, <laughs> I will predict that Ahmed Shah will continue to play a major role in how the BJP runs itself. I've heard various names of people who are likely successors, but I think in the background, everyone knows who has the ear of the Prime Minister. And that is Ahmed Shah. And there is no, I can tell you, there is no one else that has the trust and support of the Prime Minister than Ahmed Shah. He is totally committed, and Ahmed Shah himself is totally committed to Narendra Modi. Someone asked me the other day, is Ahmed Shah the likely successor to Narendra Modi? You will never hear it from him. He will, I'm, I am sure he will never give an impression that he is a contender for the position until Modi for some reason might leave and then he might be a contender for a position, but not now. He is a total, he is totally committed and has been from the time that they were together in Gujarat and even earlier, they both have a similar training in the Rashtriya Swayam Sevik Sung. I don't want to go into that because I can get a complicated subject, but they both have training in that. They were both full-timers in that. They both work together in Gujarat, and they work together here. And Amit Shah has done what the prime minister wants. He has produced electoral victories again and again, not only at the national level, but he has taken a concern at the state level. Another interesting question long-term comes in is to what extent will the center shape the politics of the states. My guess is even more so in the future than it was in the past. Okay, let's take a, a little bit of a look at the messaging that he did, and other parties may try to duplicate that. He established booth level committees all over India where you had had X number of party workers who had two tasks in mind. One was to bring out the vote, and one was to give suggestions as to how the candidates should address the issues in the campaign. Issues vary and they change. And you have to have a sense of what is it the people wanted. He was very concerned that they get proper messaging in the various districts where the party was running. A second uh, part of that machinery was they identified all 250 million recipients of welfare benefits that the Indian government provided and were in touch with them that they should go out and vote. Now, they had to be careful how much uh, you know, propaganda they put out on these, this messaging, but it was clear that you know, the, the idea was you go out and, and, and you vote for the person or the party that gave you these, these goodies, and that is the Bharatiya Janata Party. There was then a third group that they could rely on, and that was the Rashtriya Svayam Sevik Sangh, the RSS, this group I mentioned a few uh, 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 minutes ago. The RSS has a cadre of activists, maybe two and a half to three million, plus a large number of people who have been in their training camps, and they have about 100 organizations that penetrate all parts of Indian society. That cadre came out and worked for Narendra Modi as well, also identifying issues that the party should address to get support. Modi himself, you know, trusted, as I'm told, trusted what Amit Shah told him. And Amit Shah, you know, wanted the, uh, the campaign to focus on Modi, and it did. And apparently to great success. Finally, let me say a few words about Modi himself, a tireless orator whose early experience in drama showed off. If any of you watch the Prime Minister, I, I suggest you do so. Turn on YouTube, watch Narendra Modi, particularly before and after he speaks. Before he speaks, he sits there rather quietly, doesn't talk to anybody. He gets up, it's as if a switch was turned, and he comes alive, 
and gives you a performance. I saw him in Madison Square Garden at his first speech in Washington, D.C., and it was a duplication of that. He sat there quietly while the things were going on, on the screen about him, and he wasn't really paying attention. Got up and as if he was on stage, which in a sense, he was. He's a fantastic orator. You know, probably one of the best, if not the best, that you have in India. And in part, I think that's why he has, in many ways, modeled himself after the, talk, the, the speaking style of Atul Bihari Bajpai, who was, in many ways, a hero of his in terms of what, how he presented himself to the public. Now, the opposition fell into Amit Shah's trap of, its, of themselves focusing on Modi. And for those of you who are in advertising know that, that bad advertisement in many ways is as good as good advertising because it focuses people on who you are. The Prime Minister could argue, as he did, that he was a tested leader, ready to serve as Prime Minister, and there was no one else who had comparable experience or work in politics that he had. Then Pakistan or Pakistanis inadvertently did him a favor in February. There was the attack in Kashmir, claimed by a Pakistani-based group, and that inadvertently furthered Bodhi's effort to win. Polls taken in, uh, in January and February, and then again in late March, show a difference. Modi is up 30, and the BJP is up 30 to 40 seats on the average in the latter polling than the earlier polling. A significant advance that I think has something to do with the, with the focus that entered the campaign on national security and terrorism in the country. And they made good use of that. And they also so pointed to the Congress's lack of concern for that, or apparent in the aftermath of the Mumbai attack in 2018, 2008. In the Indian case, Modi had ordered an attack. While the plane was down and the pilot was captured, the people, in, in my view, still gave Modi enormous credit for being tough and standing up for Indian rights where that was not seen in 2008. In fact, a Hollywood movie was made called Hotel Mumbai. If you haven't seen it, take a look. Because it has a very pro-Indian, and maybe they couldn't have any other approach, in the movie. I was watching the movie in an area that had a lot of Indian young men in the movie and was what, like watching a movie in India. They, oh, go get them, go get those awful Pakistanis. It, but it was that kind of sentiment that was aroused in India as well. And that movie, in a sense, captures that to a certain extent. So at this critical point in the campaign, just weeks before the election was to begin, nationalism and security emerged as an important issue. And running through the campaign is something else, and that there is a Hindu nationalist strain that runs through the campaign. And it, ra it ranged from the proposed policy to exclude Muslims as refugees to India uh, for, for those people who were coming, uh, but that they would not include Muslims. Construction of a Ram temple at Ayodhya on a site that is claimed by Muslims and the use of religious spaces to identify with the Hindu cultural mainstream. For example, the 17 hours that the Prime Minister spent at Kedarnath, a cave dedicated to Lord Shiva, which was then widely broadcast. Okay, let me, since my time is running out, let me briefly mention some questions that I think we should consider as we look to the future of Indian politics. One is, is the BJP victory an inflection point in Indian politics? And the ambassador mentioned that issue himself in his remarks. I think it is, and the question is how much. Some have argued that it'll be a dramatic shift, perhaps meaning the end of secularism as we know it in India. And others have argued that India is too diverse and Hinduism is too diverse to accommodate a singular cultured order. In a new book that Swapan Das Gupta has written about the history of Hindu nationalism, he argues that Hindu nationalism, different from Marxism, doesn't have built into it a ideological justification of dictatorship or authoritarian control. And he actually goes to some extent, because that has been one of the major arguments used about the uh, you know, Hindu nationalism, is that it will lead to something that could, could end up as an uh, authoritarian state. Now, 
much of what happens in terms of whether this is true, whether you have an inflection point or not, is, how, is whether the BJP becomes the hegemon of Indian politics that the Congress was between 1947 and the late 1980s. And we'll get an answer to that in the next five, six months because you have several states who are going to the polls in the next few months. And we'll see how well the BJP does in those polls in different parts of the country. The other question is one I'd like to hear some views from the audience on this. If one assumes greater influence of Hindutva as an ideology and a philosophy in India, is Hindutva able to come up with creative solutions to India's diversity and to the growth um, of the Indian economy? It's not at all sure whether that's possible. Uh, and so we'll have to wait to see if, in fact, that happens. Um, a fourth, which I think will be addressed uh, by someone else, uh, is whether Modi will be able to push for economic reforms in India, particularly the creation of jobs, which he has not been all that good at in the last five years of his regime. And a fifth question is, will Modi be able to establish a growth consensus, and you, I think, mentioned this, uh, Ambassador, within the Sung family? Because within the Sung family, there are groups that have major differences on economic reforms. And so far, in my view, that's been the biggest obstacle to India moving forward to get real economic reforms. So if you want to analyze what's happening, the best place to, to, to analyze it is to read two magazines in India, two weeklies. One is Panchajanya, which is the Hindi newspaper of the RSS, and the other one is Organizer. And I think you can get both of them uh, on your internet because they will, be, they will have articles and letters that go into these issues as I think the Prime Minister is going to push for both of them. Finally, why did the polls get it so wrong? I'm, it's reminded of the debate after the 2016 election in the United States where the polls almost all got it wrong. I think one or two get, came close, but they were by and large wrong. My colleagues in Washington, I'm now getting emails from them who follow India, are shocked. <laughs> Partly shocked because they got it so wrong. So what, are we, what were we not looking at and what should we look at to get a more accurate sense of what's happening in India? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Anderson, for that overarching view of the, the political challenges before the new government as well as analyzing uh, um, the result itself. May I now call upon uh, Dr. Sindhapal Singh, a uh, former colleague uh, at ISAS, to talk about the foreign policy challenges before the government now that the, the Minister of External Affairs is under the capable hands of Dr. S. Jai Shankar, who was in, in incidentally a uh, visit, distinguished visiting fellow at ISAS not too long ago. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Rona Joy. Uh, firstly, let me thank uh, ISAS um, for making this joint event possible. Uh, Directors, uh, Professor Rajamohan, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, thank you. I think from a base of zero joint events before this, we managed to do two in a very short space of time. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, I. I told Ronald Joy I would take about 10 minutes, so let me just, um, I'll do a very quick overview. I, I find these exercises such as this very daunting because it involves speculating on what's going to happen and invariably you always get proof wrong. And also when you talk about Indian foreign policy in the presence of C. Rajamohan, it's doubly daunting. So I'm going to stick my neck out and uh, just give you a very really broad overview of the kinds of, I guess, continuities, challenges uh, that India might face uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi will encounter in his um, second term. I'll look at four areas. One, of course, is the India-US relationship, the India-China relationship, uh, the India-Pakistan relationship, and what I will say, uh, the last, what I call uh, India's neighborhood policy. The India-US relationship, of course, uh, has been on an upward trajectory, and this comes from even before um, uh, the, the, the NDA came to power under Manmohan Singh, because the first uh, Modi's, uh, first, the first administration, the first term, they, they built on it, especially in the defense and security sector. So you got the logistics agreement, for example, things that probably a Congress-led government couldn't have done or were less willing to do than the BJP did. 
Now, of course, the idea is for in the next term for, for India to build on this uh, trajectory. Donald Trump and uh, Narendra Modi seem to like each other very much. They both seem to have similar ideas about uh, not, being, not being reticent about flexing military muscle to some extent. I think, of course, the problem is, as Rona Joy sort of signaled earlier, is uh, this issue of the, the trade frictions which are coming in. I'll leave it to uh, my good friend Amit Indu Palit to talk a bit about that, but you can see that uh, kicking in. And I think the problem, of course, would be as Donald Trump reaches uh, his election year phase, this will become even more problematic because you see in Donald Trump, uh, for him, the, the domestic agenda trumps everything else. No matter what kind of close ally you are, the domestic imperative is important. But I think in the context of um, India-US relations, one or two things I just want to highlight. One is, I think my opinion, the, the earlier when the, in, when the US-China trade war started, and now you see the spilling over into the security domain, for India, actually, that for a while, that was a, a, relatively, a relatively sweet spot. Because some amount of calibrated competition between US and China for India is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. The problem here, of course, is calibrating something which you have no control over. And I think the worry now is that if this competition starts to become even more heated, firstly, India's um, dependence on the liberal trade regime would be badly affected. India needs to be just the, the figures release uh, the, 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 the unemployment rate, one of the highest for many, many years. And of course, depending on, India will depend on a liberal trade regime in order to grow by a certain percentage of GDP every year in order to bring people out of poverty, to create jobs, etc. And so that would be one problem. I think the second problem, of course, would be, and we've seen this happening recently, about how the trade war is spilling over into the security domain. And we, in Singapore, the Shangri-La Dialogue, the two statements made by the US representative and the Chinese representative, for example, point towards this spillover into the security domain. Very strong statements made by the Chinese representative and very strong statements made by the American representative. The problem for India, of course, now would be um, the danger of being, having to choose, not say having to choose side, but being sucked into any kind of my, uh, 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 any kind of confrontation that will happen in the maritime space. I don't think the US and China will engage in open hostilities, but anything even short of that in the sea lines of communications, for example, you don't want to be sucked in. And this is, I guess, something that even other countries have said uh, more recently about not wanting to choose sides between the two countries. Of course, India is more aligned to the US, but there is a line I think India don't want to cross for its own national interest. Now with China, I think China will remain India's main strategic challenge. I mean, that, that is, I don't think anyone will argue with that. The problem is that how do you deal with it? The early idea, uh, Modi 1.0, if you must, was to engage China economically, but not to see too much of strategic space to China where possible. And for a while, it seemed to be working at least in the first half of the administration. The problem, of course, was the BRI. Now, if China thinks that most of its economic engagement with other countries must happen through the BRI, the Indian state is in a bit of a fix because they have rejected the BRI for various reasons. And therefore, if the major part of economic engagement with China must happen through the BRI, India is in a very difficult position economically. Number two, I think India also understands that there have been, recently there have been, I think, certain tactical um, um, swaps given to each other. I think uh, China agreeing to Mazud Azhar being blacklisted. Some people say that India in return has been uh, less vocal publicly about criticisms of the BRI. But these are all very short term, I think, give and take. Um, the BRI will, in a sense, the, 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 that won't go away. China's not going to do away the BRI. India cannot afford to shift its position on the BRI and just maybe afford not to say too much or criticize the BRI too much. So that will be one long, I guess, for the next administration, this will be a big issue to deal with. Now Russia. I think with Russia, the, the main problem for India, the, the growing relationship, the, the strengthening relationship between China and Russia it's a very formidable challenge. They would like the Americans to improve their relationship with Russia. In fact, I think under Obama is probably worse. But with Donald Trump, with his Mueller investigation, Ameri uh, supposed Russian interference in the, in, in the US elections, I think India l looks at 
growing China Russia uh, friendship and the defense and security cooperation as a as, as something to uh, as a as a very big challenge and something that I think India again finds outside its control because no matter how much you engage with Russia. The problem is not the India-Russia relationship. The problem is the U.S.-Russia relationship, which India, for a large extent, cannot control. <clears throat> now, let's quickly come to the India-Pakistan relationship. There, I mean, this, again, as uh, Professor Walter Anderson just um, outlined earlier, Rana Joy sort of highlighted, it is accepted wisdom that the Pulwamana attack and the reprisals uh, allowed the BGP to accrue uh, electoral gains. That is accepted, more or less. Now, what is not clear is the details of who attack who and where. I mean, that we can, we can talk about that some other day. Now, if the lesson is that being hard on Pakistan gives you uh, electoral advantages, it's hard to see, at least for the next year or so, India compromising anything to do with Pakistan. Pakistan to a large extent, has always been a domestic politics issue. It's not, it's a less a foreign policy issue and more domestic politics issue. So I, I, I do not see in the next one year any kind of toying of the relationship. Because if, if it gives you electrical, uh, electoral gain, there's no real reason to, 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 to adopt a softer line. But, I, and, but the caveat here is, despite the fact that, you know, the, 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 the idea that India crossed the LOC for the first time, since 1971, the, pro, the, the other lesson here is that Pakistan did retaliate. And the fear, of course, now is, do you want this to escalate? Because the Pakistanis did escalate it. So the next time a major terrorist attack happens in India, and the next time people start linking it to Pakistan, what are you going to do? You cannot do less than that. But if you do the same, then there will be a reprisal attack. So what, how do you deal with this? And this is going to be a, a, a big challenge for, 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 for India. Now let me just go to the neighbourhood. Um, in terms of the, the, the I, I guess the, the, the aesthetics of it, the first time Modi was sworn in, he brought all the Sark countries together. Right? This time he's brought the Bim State countries together. I think before, the, in the last two or three years, pe most people um, did not know what Bim State was. You know, it was an initiative that was there, and then like many other initiatives that India leads, was slowly dying a natural death. Recently, he invited the Bimstead countries over, and I think that this is quite interesting because I think the strategy here is to engage South Asia by bracketing out Pakistan. Right? That's the that, that's one part of the Bimstead strategy that I will engage my South Asian neighbours, but I take Pakistan out. So Sark is obviously out. But in addition to that, Bimstead also allows India to engage with on it, on its eastern frontier. I think Myanmar increasingly is a key country for India in terms of engagement. This is where some, some people go a bit too far to say Myanmar is the next Afghanistan. I think it is stretching it a bit. But Myanmar will remain a place where India and China will compete for strategic advantage, political influence. So again, uh, the, the, that will become important. However, I think this idea of having military exercises under the Bimstead umbrella was a slight, I, I don't think was uh, something that, that they should gone away, gone ahead straight away. I think the Bimstead countries want India to lead in infrastructure development. Now, the project, the India Myanmar uh, Thailand Trilateral Highway, is a project that needs to be completed very, very soon. If it doesn't happen, India's credibility will be again be undermined. Because these countries are looking for infrastructure development, connectivity, and so I think that'll be another challenge for um, for for India. Beyond uh, moving for, I mean, moving. If we take the eastern frontier, I think the other part about India's neighbourhood is India is going to this this. This particular, the new, this second term, the Modi government will look to increasing its engagement on its eastern frontier. And here, if you look at how India has pushed for inclusion as the state of Malacca power, I think for me it's very interesting. India wants to play the security provider role in the Straits of Malacca. And I think slowly the Straits of Malacca countries are slowly coming around. I think nearly all of them have come around. Again, this is very important. Wouldn't it happen? This is something that under, under maybe a Congress government wouldn't have happened. And I think for India, this is part of a larger policy of building bilateral networks with countries in East Asia and Australia. So here we have very deep relationship. India's defense relationship with Singapore, of course, we all know is a very deep relationship. Australia, Japan, and other countries in Southeast Asia. So again, I think the uh, India-Thailand relationship will be something very important to watch. I think within the next one year, there will be very important uh, developments within um, that, that um, relationship. 
I got maybe one minute, Ronaldo. I can. I am going to now. I'm going to stick my neck out because especially when Raja is here. Uh, Afghanistan. I think the this probably is the one of the largest dilemma that they're going to face. Because every if you if, if there is a narrative about Indian foreign policy is always that in the last ten years Indian foreign policy has been on the up. Afghanistan is where it's on the down. And again, for factors beyond India's control, the U.S. decision to pull out, the U.S. decision to accept the Taliban more and more as a formal partner. In fact, the only partner in negotiations among the four or five countries that are involved has made India's options uh, made India. India's options very difficult. Do you now recognize the Taliban after having a policy of saying you must have the elected government in uh, in, in Kabul um, as 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 the sole negotiator, at least in the room? So I think that is going to be a big problem for India. I mean, some time ago, I remember Raja was saying that having India's presence in Afghanistan is a bonus. If you are not there. It's Pakistan's to lose, not India's to win. I remember a long time ago, and I think that's probably the situation now. I think uh, that the Afghanistan situation would be such that India will, at best, try to become one of the four or five countries that. But again, the Taliban causes a problem. I think the last time the unofficial talks, they sent two retired um, uh, bureau, uh, diplomats. But again, I think the Taliban thing is going to be a problem. They might have to cede the space. Um, but I think, again, this will be a major challenge for the administration. I will uh, end there, and thank you again for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh, for the insights into the foreign policy challenges ahead of the uh, Modi government. May I now call upon a final speaker for the afternoon, uh, Dr. Mithendu Palit, a colleague of mine at ISAS, who will really be talking about how the new government tackles some of the most pressing issues before the government things like job creation, uh, uh, anemic uh, uh, investment, et cetera, especially given that the inter international environment is somewhat less favorable than when Prime Minister Modi took charge in the first term. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sain. And uh, let me uh, begin with a couple of uh, what we typically call in our uh, fields as stylized facts. On the day when uh, Prime Minister Modi's cabinet uh, took oath, there were two uh, pieces of statistic that hit the national media and the international media. One was that India recorded the slowest rate of quarterly GDP growth for several years now. Growth was at 5.8%, taking it below China. And the second was, according to official statistics released by the government of India itself, the unemployment rate in the country was the highest in the last 45 years. Now, these numbers were released on the 31st of May, and the numbers basically referred to a period of the financial year 2017, financial year 2018, and the GDP specifically for the quarter, June, uh, January to March. The point that is important to note is that the economic deceleration or the unemployment rate is something which is not a nightly affair, doesn't happen overnight, has been in the economy for several months altogether. And when the statistics bear this out, uh, it also points to the fact that joblessness is particularly high among the educated urban workforce and the youth. Now, India has been living with this for quite some time. One year, two year, maybe two and a half years. The point is that normally the assumption would be that these factors would go against the incumbent government and the prime minister. But why didn't it happen that way? Why did it happen that in spite of these difficulties, India chose to vote for the incumbent government and the Prime Minister Modi? What were the economics involved? Before we come to that question, I think that's, that's actually a tantalizing question to look into. Let me just also allude to the fact that the BJP President Amit Shah, the current Home Minister, delivered a very important speech the day the election results were declared. And this was at night at the BJP party headquarters. And one of the important points which he made in that speech was, there were actually 17 states, uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Sain will correct me if I'm wrong, there were actually 17 states where out of the votes cast, BJP got more than 50% of the votes that had been cast. And if one looks at these 17 states, there are large states of India, like MP, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Haryana, 
Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, Jharkhand, where the BJP has done remarkably well, and also the state of UP, where the BJP had got almost 50% of the total votes cast. The point to be noted is that these are states where the BJP has done very well. These are states which cover the western coastal plain, go up to north and northwest, and cover a part of the hinterland, central hinterland of India. These are states where agrarian distress has been high. These are states where joblessness has been high. These are states where all the favorite downsides of the analysts predicting a dismal scenario of the BJP was evident in visible proportions then why did the bjp get returned from all these states in the way it did well before we come to that question again and just to hold on to a suspense for a couple of minutes more it's important to look at two structural characteristics of the indian economy the first is india is a consumption driven economy in india 56 to 57 percent of the gdp from an aggregate demand perspective is driven by consumption much less of it is from investment, unlike many other economies of the world, such as China, for example. And this is something which is going to surprise you. Consumption in India is not declining. According to statistics put out by the government of India, private final consumption expenditure has been growing at a rate of an average 7.5% over the last four years. Private final consumption expenditure at a per capita level on a per head basis has grown from 6% to 6.8% between 16-17 to 17-18. And this is higher than the rate of growth in per capita income, which essentially means that consumption is the key to the sustenance of the economy. And this is where I'm tempted to remember one particular comment which Dr. Manmohan Singh had made several years ago while presenting one of the budgets. Good economics does not necessarily have to be bad politics. Good economics can be good politics as well. And this is where I think it's important to note, the best benefit for the BJP this time around has been delivered from very smart economics, and which has contributed to dividend-oriented politics. The affluent never really had issues with the BJP. The affluent were comfortable in the space which they had, which the BJP never tried to crack. Demonetization might have been just a little bit of a temporary setback for the cash reach. But the BJP's worry at it went into the 2019 general elections was primarily with two groups in the economy. The first was the farmers. And within farmers, the small farmers. And let's not forget the fact that the states that turned BJP to power with more than 50% votes are primarily agricultural states. These are not states like Tamil Nadu, or say, for example, uh, Karnataka, which are primarily the industrial states of India. These are primarily agricultural states. BJP's worry in these states was primarily with the small farmers group who are struggling with agrarian distress. And secondly, the hardest hit of demonetization that was taken by the informal sector and traders associated with it. The challenge for BJP is to work out smart economic policies which would actually ad address the requirements of these two sections of the population. So what it did was, it went into a series of welfare economics oriented initiatives, which were targeted initiatives. The first, the Prime Minister Kisan scheme, which, and it's important to mark the difference, Congress won three state elections in December. Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, all states returned BJP back to power overwhelmingly. In all three states, Congress announced immediately after coming to power debt relief for farmers. Agricultural loans were waived off. BJP didn't walk the agricultural loan path. It put money directly hands, in the hands of the farmer by committing a huge sum in the union budget, which is around 15 billion Singapore dollars. And this was not enough. The most important and the most smart part of the trick was that before the financial year ended, and before these regions went to vote, BJP on retrospective effect actually put money in the hands of the people before the financial year came to a close. Because otherwise, all schemes start taking effect from the next financial year. And by the next financial year, the elections would have started. So there was an allotment made in the previous financial year. This was of around 4 billion Singapore dollars which worked on 
putting money in the hands of the farmers directly through the direct benefit transfer schemes. And the state where this worked to maximum efficiency was Uttar Pradesh, supported by the fact that there was a UP government led by the BJP, which worked overnight to submit as many applications from eligible small farmers as possible who could get this little bit of amounts, 2,000 rupees, but in India, for small farmers, 2,000 rupees do mean a lot into their bank account. What happened with the Congress states? The Congress states even today have not been able to finish 25% of debt relief to the farmers to which they promised that because it's been caught up in bureaucracy. It's been caught up by the procedural levels of the banks and the clearances and the debt cycles and the installments and the interest on the previous debt to be adjusted with the next debt and the paperwork from ignorant farmers on the collateral, all the guarantee, it's stuck. BJP did not follow this path at all. It just walked on putting money in the hands of the people. Along with it, another brilliant move, organizing and announcing a scheme for job reservation for the economically forward castes of the country. The economic forward castes were actually very, very unhappy. Nobody talks about them. And that is where the joblessness anguish has been very, very high. And in one stroke, this was a little blow, that the economically forward castes we are very much within our specter of things, and the BJP would be looking forward to safeguarding their interests, as well as ensuring the fact that across the country, in as many BJP-ruled states as possible, announce high procurement prices for agricultural crops. Well, these were three specific schemes targeted at specific groups of economic actors. There were two schemes, and one has to give Credit to the foresight of Prime Minister Modi and BJP for these two schemes, which really, really influenced the opinion for a very important group of the economy, and that is the women. There were two schemes. The first is the celebrated Ujwala scheme, which involves providing cooking gas at free to several poor households and villages, and the states where this produced the maximum results were again the Hindi heartland states, where most of the cooking in the poor households was done on fossil fuel. The availability of cooking gas free made a huge, huge difference to the way the conditions under which women cook in this families make a difference. Now, this had started providing benefits for BJP well before. This started providing benefits for BJP in the UP assembly elections. And the stream of benefits continued. And finally, uh, nobody today alludes to it anymore. But the fact that right from the beginning, Mr. Modi focused on building toilets for women actually has made a difference to the perception of, of the larger welfare focus. So long-term implications. What, what does a Modi 2.0 uh, victory mean for India? The first. I think India is going to see much more of welfare economics. This is as opposed to a neoclassical market-based economics model insofar as economic management is concerned. And India is not an exception in this regard. There are several countries of the world, including the United States of America, which is increasingly pushing towards a model which is broadly defined as compensatory politics, where more money is being attempted to be put in the hands of people. In the neighborhood, in Southeast Asia, we have examples. We have examples like this coming out from Indonesia, where there has been direct cash support made available for bringing down poverty. We have examples coming out of Malaysia in terms of standardization of minimum wages. So I think India is not an exception to the global trend. There's going to be a strong push from welfare economics what does this mean for market-oriented reforms? I think it's important to note one thing. What are the reforms left for Mr. Modi? By the time he took office in 2014, a substantial amount of economic reforms had already been done in India. What was left to be done, what people are normally fond of pointing out, are two sectors, land and labor. Land, at the end of the day, in India, remains a state subject. Without the help of Indian states, it's not possible to make a movement on land. And Indian states individually are finding out their own ways. We have several examples. We have Andhra, we have Odisha, we have Himachal, who are working in their own specific ways of creating amendments 
in land acquisition policies to ensure that they can procure lands for their land bank. Second, we are talking about labor. Let's not forget that six months after Mr. Modi was elected the first time, the government of Rajasthan actually introduced labor law reforms by amending the celebrated Industrial Disputes Act of 1956, it's section 5B, for taking away the cap on the hire and fire rules. But I think there's one important point of Mr. Modi's economic management which very few people have noticed. When we talk about labor law reforms or labor reforms, we tend to focus only on the protection, the high degree of protection and over-regulation for the formal labor force, which is just around 11, 12, 11 or 12% of the total labor force of the country. What about the informal labor force, which is completely unregulated, unprotected? And this is where I think Mr. Modi's steps have made a very important impact. Like the, one of the first decisions he took after becoming prime minister the second time was to organize and announce a pension initiative for the informal sector workers, 3,000 rupees per month. That was a part of the BJP manifesto. So I don't really think there's an enormous amount of work left to be done in those sectors because, again, Labor laws cannot proceed without the cooperation of the state governments, probably. A conversation will be started. Probably more and more states will be brought around into those areas. But the more important point is that I think we are going to see a fundamental change coming in in Modi 2.0. There are going to be sectors of the Indian economy where the government is going to play a much more prominent role than what is being done now. because. Eventually, it comes down to Mr. Modi's vision of economic management where he prefers a centralized management and he prefers more control. So when we look at important sectors like railways, for example, I think railways is a sector where the Indian government and the public sector is going to remain extremely important. He's going to divide turfs. When it comes to telecom equipment production, we can expect a lot of private investment. But when it comes to telecom regulation, when it comes to telecom pricing, I think the Indian state is going to play the key role in determining what's the price. Because this, again, is extremely important for following the welfare economics model that he wants to pursue. The government must have a control on prices in important sectors. It can't afford to let the market carry away the prices. When it comes to, let's say, something like uh, the standard Modi vision, I expect the emphasis on improving doing business to continue. It's going to continue in a forceful way. It's made a big difference to the perceptions regarding India. It's going to continue. Uh, the challenge, huge, huge challenge, is that in order to all this, where do the revenues come from? And this is where I think uh, I, I would stick my neck out in a sufficiently safe way if I can take that position, however oxymoronic it may sound. I think we are going to see privatization of some public enterprises. And, and I'm not pointing to privatization of Air India. I don't think Air India will be privatized. But there are public sector enterprises which are going to be privatized because this is the only way non-debt creating capital receipts which can flow into the government budget for giving it revenues which it desperately wants for funding the welfare finance. Uh, I don't think India is going to really, really open up in an aggressive fashion. But wh what India is certainly going to do and likely to do is to look at ways for mobilizing foreign exchange. And if it does that, there has to be some selective opening up that needs to be done. And particularly when India is expected to follow a foreign policy which puts maximization of economic interests as its central goal. So what I expect to happen is a huge boost to sectors like tourism, for encouraging more and more tourists into India. Civil aviation is going to get opened as much as possible across open skies policy. And there are three regions of the world with which India is likely to work much more closely for getting deeper market access for its not just exports, but also investments. The first of this, fortunately or unfortunately, is Southeast Asia. I think Indian engagement with Southeast Asia, economic engagement, is going to increase much more than what it is right now. India is going to work much, much more closely with the Middle East, including with countries like Saudi Arabia. And India is going to work very closely with Africa. And yes, 
the last submission that I have in this right, I am prepared to stick my neck out and say, India is going to work much harder on expanding its economic relationship with China. I'm very confident that's going to be a central part of India's external engagement policy. There are areas where I think we are going to see the Modi government uh, be a lot more vigilant, a lot more economically active, a lot more state-focused, and these are some of the relatively new areas, like, say, for example, the digital economy. The digital economy is something which the government is going to keep for itself. Whether it, it means draconian localization policies, whether it means a middle path, whether it means selective cross-border exchange is not something that we will figure out. But incidentally, these are also likely to be areas where India is going to work much more closely with a few global partners, including China, I suppose. Thank you so much.